What do you want me to look at the camera? Or, or, yeah, yeah, I, 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 either way is fine. Either, okay. It's not that fun. Our production values aren't that stringent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, we're rolling. All right, it's Wednesday, July 18, 2007, at the New York State Military Museum. We're interviewing John Bissett. John, where'd you grow up? Born and raised in Malone, New York, in the northern part of Franklin County, County seat. Mm -hmm. uh, star of the North, and all that sort of propaganda. Yeah. And now your dad was in the military. Yes, my father was in the National Guard in Malone, enlisted in 1910. Before War I, by 1917, he was a sergeant, uh, mobilized with uh, uh, the regiments of the Guard, and uh, uh, went down to Spartanburg uh, with, at Camp Wadsworth uh, with the units. And uh, there, like about one-third of his local company, which is Company K of the 1st New York uh, Guard, uh, about one-third of his company became the core of a uh, pioneer infantry regiment, and he himself became first sergeant of Company K within that regiment. As, as you well know, the uh, rest of the company went with the uh, uh, 27th Division and had its own path in World War I. Mm -hmm. My father followed that uh, outfit. And uh, toward the end of the Argonne campaign, he was pulled from the trenches and got a commission in the uh, Army of the United States, uh, came home as a second lieutenant. Uh, an interesting aside, I think. Uh, he went over as a first sergeant, uh, therefore he went in a second class in, in a converted German cruise ship. Uh, he came back first class being a second lieutenant. And he always liked that. Uh, and then he had a subsequent career as uh, a lieutenant and then a captain in the local National Guard Company, which was Company I of the 105th Regiment. And uh, he was the commander of it from 1926, I believe it was, until 1939 as captain. So you grew up around the Malone Armory. That's right. That's right. You knew in it well. Building. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I knew it in my own way as well, and I don't know when you want to cover it, but uh, when I was a teenager, I joined the Civil Air Patrol up there. Oh, really? Oh. And, uh, and I guess it's a good time to segue into that. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Malone, uh, born in 1936, so I'm, I'm, I'm six years old, five years old when uh, we entered World War II. By that time, Company I has gone off and has been mobilized into uh, World War II as well. And uh, uh, they, uh, they formed the State Guard up there, and my father uh, becomes a, uh, the commander of the local State Guard company. Well, uh, I get fascinated by aviation World War II stories course, and the fact that about the only thing up there that was flying was uh, the local Civil Air Patrol unit, a couple of Oronkas and Piper Cubs and so on. I'd see these things in the air, and I was a six-year-old kid. I loved it. One day I saw a B-17 go over, low, buzzing the town, and uh, I was having to be outside in the summer. This is an interesting story, I think. This airplane comes buzzing low over the town. I knew it was a B-17 because I studied airplanes, and it disappeared off to the northeast. And 15 years later, I'm in a bar in Malone, age 18. Uh, uh, actually, no, a lot later than that, uh, about age 21. I'm in, I'm in the, uh, this bar in Malone, and there's a guy sitting next to me, and he's an older fellow, and I knew that he'd been in the Army Air Forces in War II. So I asked him uh, about his service, and he told me I'd flown and so and so. And, uh, B-17s pilot, and I said, and I told him the story about seeing this B-17 fly over. He said, that was me. <laughs> I said, ooh. He said, well, we were ferrying the B-17 over to Europe, and uh, didn't take much to divert off, and I wanted to buzz the town, let the folks know. So I went, came roaring low over to town, headed off towards Maine, or wherever it was they were going to land next. And I, I did the old, oh boy, wild trick, and of course, and and, uh, and he, he gave me some advice. He says, uh, you're, going, you're going in the Air Force? And I said, yeah, I'm going to be a navigator. He says, watch out. You better not pray for any damn war. He says, I, there was about three of us who were the only survivors of our squadron that, that made it back. Wow. So it, and it turned out it was in 1943 when we took especially heavy casualties. So mm -hmm. uh, I was sobering. Mm -hmm. At any rate, I grew up in Malone. Uh, at age 15, I joined the local Civil Air Patrol squadron as a mm -hmm. cadet, and uh, I was in February 52, and I graduated high school in August of 54, and by that time I was 
an extremely small version of my father because I was a cadet squadron commander. <laughs> marching and drilling in the Malone Armory. And uh, uh, I thought that was kind of cool. And we did some flying out of the local airport up there, Malone mm -hmm. to Fort Airport. Uh, and I got the bug. You know, I wanted to do something about aviation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I had gotten up enough uh, moxie, I'd done enough uh, academically, and so on. I was a salutatorian of a high school class, and uh, was going to uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute down here in Troy, and I was going to be an aeronautical engineer. So I signed up for Air Force ROTC. That was partially because I wanted to go into Air Force and be to avoid the draft implications. And, we all had to cope with in, the, in that time frame, 1950s. So from 54 to 58, I was at the RPI in Troy and did some drilling in the Troy Armory uh, because we did some of that work there. That's slightly bigger than the Malone Armory. Um, most of our drill was outside in the parking lot next to Troy High School. Uh, and I, with my mighty Civil Air Patrol background, knew more about drilling than the rest of those clods did. Well, incidentally, I had gone to summer camp in Civil Air Patrol down at uh, Stewart Air Force Base in Newburgh in 52 and 53. That was my first exposure to anything close to the real Air Force. And in 54 at uh, Samson Air Force Base, Geneva, New York, mm -hmm. which at the time was, uh, uh, was a basic military training base for the Air Force. So I got a little bit of the real Air Force at that time. Did uh, four years of, of ROTC at, at the RPI. Summer encampment uh, was the uh, summer of 57 at, 40, at Ethan Allen Air Force Base, uh, Winooski, Vermont. And by this time, of course, I was, uh, when I graduated in 58, got the commission, gold bar, second lieutenant. Uh, I, had been, I had been a senior member of the Civil Air Patrol squadron in Troy as well during this time frame when I was in college. So the first kid to pop me a salute as a genuine Air Force officer was one of my Civil Air Patrol cadets, which I thought was cool. <laughs> he was, had become an ROTC cadet at RPI, so that all was kind of neat. Uh, so I took my engineering degree and I, you know, I, I wanted to go into the Air Force, but I didn't know whether I wanted to do a career or not. In fact, I didn't think I did. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to design airplanes, you know, get them to fly, do great stuff with, with aviation. And I thought this would be a useful thing to do in, in the Air Force. Um, and this is another aside, interesting, because I do mention in the outline that one of my first great influences was uh, Colonel Peter P. Dawson, who was a professor of air science at RPI. He uh, was very influential. He was a navigator. He was one of the seven navigator full colonels in the Air Force at the time. Well, in the spring of 55, my freshman year at RPI, uh, he had arranged for field trips. Uh, that's one of the things you did in ROTC to try and influence these college kids into joining the Air Force, making it a career, whatever. Dazzling them with BS. You know. So uh, Colonel Dawson had organized a trip down to Navigator Training School, which was then in Texas at, at uh, Ellington Air Force Base, Houston. And so I thought that would be cool. It was over Easter break and all that. So. Uh, I said I'd like to go on that. Well, the staff says you can't go on that because you put down on your paperwork that uh, when you go in the Air Force, you want to be just an engineering officer. I said, well, what do I have to do to go there? He says, you have to say you want to be a navigator. I said, okay, I want to be a navigator, so I go on the trip. <laughs> so we did that. Went on the trip. And I started getting fascinated with the stuff. He had gotten, he, Colonel Dawson, had gotten a, uh, a T-29 to fly us down. Most everybody else, when they went on their trips, what in Goonie Birds. Well, the T-29 was a fancy twin-engine prop plane, and it was a navigator trainer. So he put each one of us, eight or nine cadets, into the seats of this trainer, and he acted as the instructor. He was up and down the aisles showing us how to do the radar and light stuff up. And, uh, he, and I got fascinated. This is great stuff. Navigation is cool. And, uh, you know, you know I, I crown my achievement by the fact that he came around once and he says, okay, Cadet Massette, where are we? And I looked out the window and I looked at my map and I said, we're right over New Orleans, sir. He says, you're absolutely right. Congratulations. I think there's a big old city down there with, with the levees and it matched the map directly. I had no skill. It was just 
So we did our time at Ellington, and I was fascinated, so I went back and I changed permanently. You know, let, let me do my, my three-year stint as a navigator. This ought to be cool. I could actually fly. I had no, it was funny, but I had no inclination to become a pilot. Yeah. Uh, this, this was not in my ambition scale. I liked to be around them, and I learned early on that they BS'd very well, and they told great stories about this, but I didn't really want to be in control. But I didn't mind the idea of being a navigator, where I could, you know, as we used to say, tell them where to go. And um, uh, there was enough technical aspects to navigation, celestial navigation in particular, that that interested me. So, uh, 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 so I went off after I got the degree at RPI and went off to Boeing, got hired at Boeing, and uh, I wanted to sample civilian life in a uh, aircraft manufacturing world before actually going into the Air Force. Got a six month deferment, went to Boeing, and I basically wrote maintenance manuals for something called the Boeing uh, um, Bomark Air Defense Missile, uh, which was a ramjet a combine, a sort of a hybrid, not like today, but hybrid with a, with a solid fuel rocket to get you off the ground and then ramjets to move you at uh, two, two and a half Mach out towards the bad guy bomber where the nuclear warhead would get the bad guys. Okay. So I wrote the maintenance manuals on that for a while and then I got uh, the Nova's report to uh, Lackland Air Force Base, January 1959, which is what I did after a Christmas break back here in, in uh, Lowell. Went down there, gold bar gleaming in the sun, and went into the nav, nav train. Went off to James Conley Air Force Base, Waco, Texas, uh, which was where you did the real flying train. And with a class of about 20 others, uh, went through the whole ropes, becoming a navigator, got the wings in October of 59. You had your basic, well, you had three choices out of nav training in those days. Uh, you could uh, go for bombardier training at Mather Air Force Base, California. You could go to Keesler Air Force Base and become an electronic warfare officer. Uh, that is, jam the bad guys' electronics and learn about them. Or uh, become an air defense interceptor navigator in the back seat of, of, a, of a fighter. Uh, I chose to be a bombardier. And that went back to when I was a little kid. I thought it would be fun to blow up stuff. <laughs> like, like most kids do when they're <laughs> seven or eight years old. Especially those who were growing up in World War II. You know, you had all these stories and images and the movies and all this. So I thought this would be cool. So off, uh, off we go after October 59. About half of our class goes to Mather. At Mather, California, uh, we entered bomb nav training. Another version of the T-29 trainer, all dedicated to this complicated uh, uh, computer-driven bomb nav system that the B-47 and the B-52 had in it. Uh, at this time, all vacuum tube driven, very clunky, by, especially by today's standards, uh, but pretty complex. And you as a navigator had to learn to remove and replace lots of equipment in the airplane because SAC would not forgive you if World War III came off and you flew your mission and the radar failed and you didn't drop your, your hydrogen bomb on wherever, uh, assuming there was a SAC left, whatever. So you did all this. Along the way, in that training, I started talking to real SAC veterans and uh, people who had actually flown in the command. And I learned about what it would be like to be in SAC. And basically at the time, you were going to go on, as I say, 47s or 52s. And you were going to fly missions that would take you out and back, especially B-52s, which is if I went with one of them, I'd want to go with the big, big fella. You'd, you'd be assigned to some lovely place like Columbus, Mississippi, and you would fly 24-hour missions and you'd land back in Columbus, Mississippi. And if you were lucky, you would get Europe on the radar set. And I wanted to travel. I realized by this time I wanted to see the world. I didn't want to see it on a radar set. And uh, another thing uh, clicked into that. Uh, toward the end of that time, we're talking the spring of 1960, uh, heavily dramatized by the Francis Gary Powers shoot down of the in his U-2, uh, the word came down that SAC was changing its, its tactics. Instead of going in high, 40,000 feet, majestically sweeping over the Soviet Union and dropping the bomb and getting majestically back out, uh, because of Soviet air defense capabilities, uh, we were going to go in low, we were going to get down below the radar screen, get in 500 feet above the terrain or less. 
And I happen to look at both the B-47 and the B-52, and I realized that the, in, the, in the navigator in that airplane ejected downward. <laughs> so you'd have, and not whether they had World War II or not, or World War III or not, you would have lots of nav training missions at 500 feet or less. And I, I had enough self-regard that I'd rather survive, thank you. So I had a disincentive. I also realized by this time that a good number of people graduating from that school were not going into SAC, they were taking other assignments. So I worked like hell to get as high in the class as I could, and I, I got my preference. You, you were ranked, you, you could pick the assignments that were available to you in a order of preference. So I was able to select something very clunky. I got to become a navigator in an air refueling squadron in Tactical Air Command at Langley Air Force Base, Virginia. So I reported there in August of 1960 into this squadron. They were equipped with the KB-50 tanker. Uh, B-50 bomber had been an improvement on the B-29. Uh, and in its day, in the early 1950s, it was a pretty capable uh, medium bomber. Had the nuclear mission at the time, complemented by the B-36. Uh, but it was quickly obsoleted, and it became a trainer, and then it became tankers and a couple of other specialties. So I became a navigator on a six-man crew, two pilots, nav, flight engineer, and two refueling operators. And that was three of uh, extremely interesting flying years out of there. I was a first lieutenant by this time and uh, uh, became an instructor nav by the time we were through. Basically what we were doing was refueling fighters and we were refueling fighters mostly uh, out of places like Bermuda and the Azores and flying. Uh, we were actually sort of gas stations in the sky and by this time Tactical Air Command was deploying units routinely across the Atlantic back and forth. Excellent training for if they had to reinforce Europe or North Africa or wherever. Uh, as an aside, I am now the historian for that unit, uh, that bunch of survivors, and I have a talk about them too, about their history, why they were important and wonderful and marvelous and all that stuff, stories. At any rate, um, three interesting years doing that. You know, first time I saw refueling, I fell in love with the business. Up comes half a dozen F-100 fighters, and they come up on your wing. They plug into your hose and drogue system, take on the fuel, and you get the jaw with them on the radios and send them on their way across the Atlantic or the Pacific or wherever else. Loved it. But uh, time goes on, and the airplane became obsolete, and in came the SAC-run uh, KC-135 tankers, and rightly uh, took over the business for both Strategic Air Command and Tactical Air Command fighters. And after a spell at Squadron Officer School, and I made captain, I went on to troop carrier at Seward Air Force Base, Tennessee, flying the then fairly new C-130, which was a whole other beast. It was a marvelous airplane, very maneuverable, still is at the ground level, uh, proven itself time and again in the last 40 years in combat and out of combat uh, uh, in numerous roles. And I got to do that for about a year. Incidentally, as an aside, I have a nephew who is a, has been a loadmaster on the 109th Air Lift Wing out here at uh, Skagway County Airport, and uh, uh, has seen his Arctic and Antarctic time. But that, that, to get him to talk about that. So uh, a year of C-130s at Seward. I was just getting good at troop drop. This was a very intimidating job to me. Was dumping 64 committed 82nd Airborne paratroopers out in some place wondering whether you have them in the right spot. You don't want to piss off paratroopers <laughs> by hanging them in trees. And uh, I, like them all, I guess, I, the, the navigator basically controlled that at the time. You didn't have sophisticated electronics like you do today. And you did a lot of low-level flying. And uh, you'd pop up and you hope that there's a drop zone and you and put on the green light, all the procedures, and out they go. Uh, a lot of stories about that, but uh, I was only there a year because back at Langley in my Langley days, I had met and uh, got engaged to uh, a WAF lieutenant, First Lieutenant Carol Scholler. And uh, we got engaged about the time I left Langley to go to Tennessee. And she herself, after a spell in admin at Langley, went on to get her master's degree at Georgetown in Washington, D.C. And our agreement was we'd get married after her Georgetown time and before her next assignment. And then I would try to switch to join her at the next assignment, whatever that was. 
Well, she got assigned to Wiesbaden, Germany. So I said, I can do that. You know, I can get to Germany. I'd like to do that. So we started the paperwork rolling just as soon as we were married. We were married on the 3rd of October, 1964, in Washington. And we had a honeymoon, put her on an airplane. Uh, I almost didn't make my own wedding. Uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but in the troop carrier business of that time, in, six, in, the, in the 60s, you did an awful lot of TDY. You were everywhere at a moment's notice. And one of the things we were everywhere at was in August of 64 was the Tonkin Gulf crisis. We were mobilized and set over taking all kinds of trash, jet engines, maintenance people, maintenance facilities, the whole works to support jet fighter units that were being deployed into Southeast Asia. And we were going for who knows how long. We just said, you go, you stay. Well, my squadron commander knew that I was going to get married on the 3rd of October, I hoped, and he got me sent back just in time for my wedding. Good head. Very fine man. They needed to send an airplane back anyway. It wasn't like they did it for me. But they needed a navigator. He says, why don't you go back and get married while you're at it. Oh, okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> so we did all that, and then we applied for me to go to Wiesbaden, Germany. Carol went over there late October 64 uh, into headquarters U.S. Air Forces Europe. And I went back to Seward, did the applying, and it came through. And after a, a, a stint at Stead Air Force Base in Nevada, um, going to uh, survival training, I got sent over and I joined a flying unit at Wiesbaden Air Base, just outside of town where Carol was working. Well, this became the most interesting assignment of my military life because it, it was supposed to look like a transport unit, just hauling ash and trash around around Germany and Europe and so on. But what it really was was a covert reconnaissance unit. And they were equipped with transport-looking airplanes, C-97s, C-118s, and so on, T-29s, uh, looking like they were supposed to be doing all that, but they really had cameras and electronic uh, devices on board. At first, I was in a C-118 unit that specialized in so-called uh, special courier flights. And we were actually working for an agency, not the Air Force. And I'm not sure exactly how far I can go into that, but I'll just say we did some interesting flying. Uh, nothing too horrendous, but it was interesting. And then the mission was taken away from us, and I was relegated then to a part of the squadron where we did electronic intelligence collection missions along the east-west German border, uh, in the Baltic Sea, the East Mediterranean, uh, the Black Sea, uh, and the Berlin corridors in particular. Now, I'm also the historian for that outfit, and I have a talk about them, too, um, if anybody up here is interested. Um, the, uh, the Berlin Corridor operation was especially interesting because you actually got to fly over Soviet-controlled territory. And the nature of the corridors were that uh, you actually did fly over a lot of their military garrisons and airfields and so on. So by our inquisitive nature, we were taking photos and collecting alien on these guys. And uh, we would land at Tempelhof and, and, uh, and go out another corridor, pretend we were transport people, all this. Basically, the Soviets knew what we were up to, at least in general. They you knew the pukey Americans were collecting intel. There's a, whole, like, there's a whole history about all that business, which I'm trying to write. And I, like I say, I get talks. It was three fascinating years. Um, among the highlights were the missions to uh, in the corridors. I didn't do too many of those. Uh, other people did more of them than I did, but uh, uh, other highlights were in the Baltic Sea where you would be intercepted by Soviet fighters. And that can be interesting. You're, you're flying along and up come the Soviet interceptors and they fly off your wing. Occasionally they wave at you and you wave back. And you take their pictures and they take yours. <laughs> and, uh, and they were there to say, don't go over our airspace or we'll shoot your ass down. And we were there to say, yeah, yes, sir. We'll stay right on our course. We'll mind our own business. And we'll collect our. Well, we didn't say that, but that was the basic idea. So there was a lot of tension, but there was an implication there uh, that you know, if, if we didn't screw up, they weren't going to interfere. And by that time in the Cold War, um, both sides had matured. This is what I say in my, in my talk about them. Here. Both sides had matured to the point where neither one of them wanted to start World War III. And we were just 
watching each other very warily, as we did the rest of the Cold War, just to make sure the other side behaved and kept track of their increasing military capabilities through outfits like my own. Uh, we were just a small part of the whole overall reconnaissance uh, against the Soviets and, and, and other adversaries during all that time frame. Anyway, February of 68, those three halcyon years ended, and uh, through a very talented and very enterprising personnel sergeant in our headquarters Air Force personnel, they had arranged for us both to go to Vietnam. It was, it was a time where professional officers, professional anybody, had to have a Vietnam tour, whether you loved the idea or not. Well, we were terribly enamored of the thought. By 68, uh, it kind of looked like we weren't going to win the war real easy. And uh, even in Germany, we understood opposition was mounting to it. But you know, we were professionals. We're going to go. Uh, we, we got. A, I remember the, the phone call that came from this sergeant in Texas. He calls us up at home and he says, "I got a deal for you." And he tells us, "You, know, you two can go over. You can go to the same air base, and I can put you into AC-47 gunships. Would you like to do that?" And I said, "Well, okay." I said, "What's this about my wife going?" This is the summer of '67. He's talking. To me. I said. Uh, our understanding is that women cannot go unless they consent to go. And Carol isn't particularly interested in going right away, right now. And he said, ah, but we've just changed the policy last week. You know, we're, she's going whether she wants to go or not. But he said, if you really don't want her to go, I can finagle it. But by the time you come back, she's going. I said, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Carol's watching me, listening to all this. She's going like this. Okay, we agree, we both go. So we both went. Uh, we deployed back to the States in February 68. I go off to training in Louisiana on the C 47, the AC 47 gunship, and she goes over to Saigon. She's going to be an intelligence officer in the uh, headquarters 7th Air Force at Thompson Newt Air Base, and I'm going to be at uh, Benoit Air Base nearby, about 20, 30 miles away. And all that. Right away we knew we were going to have a problem. Uh, so that, well, we had lots of problems, but our problems paled in, uh, uh, in comparison to anybody else, and that was uh, we're going to be separated by 30 miles. That's long miles in Vietnam at the time, because trying to see your spouse across that. First off, Carol could not leave the air base. She had high security clearances. I had to visit her. Um, and often the bus service didn't run because the VC were active in the area. And also I had a hellacious flying uh, schedule. Got over, I'll talk about my thing first. I, I, I got over there in uh, mid-May of 68 and started flying missions out of Benoit. We had these AC-47 units over, up and down South Vietnam. Uh, they ranged from Da Nang in the north down to uh, uh, Canto in the south, and uh, uh, there were two or three of them up in I Corps and in II Corps. We had one in III Corps, uh, actually had in the Trang and then uh, uh, Benoit and then Canto, and we had Pleiku and Danae and one other place. These flights would have about four or five Goonie birds and about six crews to man them, and uh, the schedule was you only flew at night by this time. We'd learned lessons early on uh, in their ridiculous hubris. The Air Force guys were going to fly C-47s over any aircraft equipped uh, VC on the trails in, in, in North Vietnamese and the trails in Laos Cam and, and, and uh, South Vietnam. We lost a few airplanes before some dumb old realized you don't know, fly some lunky thing in the daytime. So we started. they started flying at night became quite effective. Uh, and by the time I got there, it was in a defensive mode, basically. You went up and you reacted to what the enemy did. Uh, we flew boring holes in the sky. Out of Benoit, for example, we would put up two airplanes at, at fundamentally sunset, fly to a little bit after midnight, and they would land. Two, we were replaced by two more. One over Benoit, one over Saigon. And if something happened, you'd get the word through the tasking system to go to 
a coordinate so and so and talk to so and so, there's a special forces camp under attack. Or a South Vietnamese village is taking mortar rounds. Or you know, whatever's wrong, go make them right. Drop flares, shoot on their command, and so on. You'd be given a frequency, you'd be given a uh, call sign, you, know, you get to location X and talk with them. And the navigator did this. This is my job, talking this. And I, we basically figured out that our job as navigators weren't especially to navigate as much, especially in three court, which was fairly flat, and we had good radio aids, uh, but was to translate grunt to pilot. Because yeah, I'd get all this stuff from the ground. Hey, Spook, they're off in the, 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 these weeds here, uh, off our northwest quadrant and uh, beyond the stream and in between those two trees. And we, it's the middle of a frapping night and we're dropping flares, trying to find the two trees and it's all this stuff. And the pilot's up there wondering where to hang to go. And so I'm, I finally find it, coordinate, talk with them. And, and if, if, if there's gunfire to be provided, so we get cleared to fire, we would, uh, the pilot would fire. AC-47 would go into a 30-degree uh, <coughs> bank, and the, uh, and the guns were depressed another 15 degrees, so you had a 45-degree pre depress angle, and the aircraft commander had a fighter pilot's gun sight mounted here. So he would fly like this, and he'd look over there, and, and you, the nav, would talk him in on the, on the target, he'd do this thing, he could line up, and he'd got a trigger there. <laughs> and that would spit one, two, or all three guns at uh, two different rates of fire out uh, down on the front lines. That was very spectacular. Right, Wayne? Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne was telling me he got to see some of the action. Uh, and it was, according to VC prisoners, very intimidating. Uh, and uh, we were quite successful doing that, we thought. And uh, we got a lot of rapport back from the to the GIs on the ground, and it was very gratifying being the guy doing this talking back and forth to uh, you know, relieve the problems these guys had. And I've had a few occasions since running into guys that uh, uh, say, hey, you help save my ass on, you know, Tudan Mountain, let me buy your beer. You know, this would be 30 years later. Hey, okay, buy me a beer, what the heck. And, uh, it may not have been me, it may not have been my era or anything like that, but uh, you know, uh, this is very, very impressive. Uh, I'm very happy to be a part of that aspect of it. The air base itself got attacked a bunch, uh, very interestingly. I got there after the famous Tet Offensive of 68, but in February 69, the, the uh, North Vietnamese tried another version of it. It was much less powerful, but it was, it was still reasonably potent enough for us to lie in a ditch for rocket rounds landed all around our airplane, and uh, it, was, it was interesting. Um, I can't say I was hugely afraid during any of this. I was varying degrees of bored, because you did fly lots and lots of boring hours, waiting for something to happen. I did a lot of reading. A lot of my combat time was taken up reading at the nav table. We had a nice light, and I could sit there reading novels or doing uh, some historical reading or whatever, and then would come the call. Uh, when you went on a target, you were too busy to be afraid. You had different degrees of anti-aircraft fire. You had very little. By the time, by the Three Corps area around Saigon and so on, in our era, the North Vietnamese and VC had no anti-aircraft weaponry except for 50 caliber machine guns. They were the only thing that threatened us at 3,000 feet above the terrain. And you'd see this very inaccurate stuff come up. And, of course, we didn't put on any of our nav lights or anything. They could only aim at where we'd been, where the fire was coming from. Uh, I can remember only one target where I felt like, ooh, this is darn interesting. You know, I, uh, uh, and for the first time, a you know, significant wonder whether I'd get through this whole thing uh, hit, hit my mind. That's because it was basically a trap. They had they'd gone after a special forces camp with a good load of, of VC from all around the camp. It was a very well planned attack and they were under, the camp was under severe distress. We got to the scene and once we got to the scene and started putting down flares, all this AAA opens up on us and they're, they're coming from about six different positions around the camp. And I had a brand new second lieutenant aircraft commander and that guy 
was beautiful. He just flew in and out around this stuff. He was he was amazing. He uh, and he dropped the flares like he was supposed to. He he hosed down the AAA sites. It was amazing. Dino, good Italian name, was his name. Well, I can't remember right now. But he was great. Uh, I've got a tape of it at home. We we had to tape our missions because. There had been some friendly fire incidents and other things, and the hierarchy said that they, that was the first time I'd seen cassette tape recorders. Hmm. They had them in our airplanes, and so if you had an interesting mission, you would try and copy the tape. And I, I've got it at home someplace. Where I suddenly, when I played it back, I realized that I was, I was yelling at Dino, the pilot, you know, hey, Dino, go baby, go, you know, all this stuff. I didn't realize I had it in me. But we, uh, we suppressed the bad guys around that camp and, and went on to life. Anyway, uh, we got reassigned. Uh, Carol uh, gets reassigned in May of 68, uh, 69. Now, we had both made major on a list that came out in um, early 1969, uh, although neither one of us had pinned it on yet. Um, and. Uh, we were at this point in our career. We, I had 10 years in, Carol had nine. We had no children. Women, you know, female officers could not, female anybody's, could not have children and stay in the military at that stage. That only changed in the 1970s. So, were we going to stay in or not? Or was I going to stay in or not? Was she going to stay in or not? So, a decision, a fundamental decision we made at that time was. Let's stay in. What can they do to us? Send us to Vietnam? We were already here. <laughs> and so uh, we decided. And the same sergeant back in personnel was still in place. And in fact, he sent us a, a, a message saying, what do you want to do next? It, he had taken to us. Hmm. I, we were that unique. We were weird. We were a husband and a wife team. And he liked both of us uh, as people. We, we got to know him personally. And uh, he liked what we were doing professionally. And uh, so I said, after coordinating with Carol, you know, Carol's already an intelligence officer, I said, I would like to join the intelligence career field. And coming out of Vietnam, you get, officers got a good chance of doing what they wanted to do. So, uh, and, I, and, I, and we, Carol and I had heard about a school at, in Anacostia, Washington, D.C., called the Defense Intelligence School which was specifically for mid-grade officers who had not been in the career field before and uh, were going to be in a joint school, Army, Navy, Air Force. And I said, that's what I would like to get in. That fits me directly. Carol had not had any formal intelligence training. She had become an intelligence officer by virtue of her master's degree in international relations. So she, she didn't know when she got to her first assignment in Germany uh, what a chart was from a map. You know, she didn't know the fundamentals. She had to learn on a job, much to the amusement of her NCOs, which is a whole other story. Uh, but she got to be darn good at it. So she got to go to the same school. So we came back. Carol came back in May of 69. I came back in August of 69. Uh, uh, the reason for that was even though I, it was a year assignment, um, they said, if you want to go to this school, it only starts in September 69. So you'll have, both of you will have to extend your tours from May to August, three more months in Vietnam. And neither one of us wanted to do that. Uh, so we wrote, wrote back and said, well, Carol's been an intelligence officer for four years now, very accomplished. Um, Surely she could do something on the staff of the school to help them out during the summer. We had heard of other people doing this. And I could help too. I've been an additional duty intelligence officer and blah, 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 blah. And they came back and said, okay, Captain Carol Bissett can join the school in you know, May of 69. As for you, have a nice summer in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, they were not impressed with my intelligence credentials. So I got back in August and uh, together we went to the school at Anacostia. And shortly after that, I pinned on my major's leaves. And not long after that, Carol, about a year later, Carol did hers. Uh, nine months of this school, got blessed as an intelligence officer, and we both got assignments to DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, in Washington, D.C. Uh, I 
got to be assigned with a group that was supporting the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the Pentagon, uh, actually doing reconnaissance support uh, based on my time in Germany. It was uh, part of the JCS called the Joint Reconnaissance Center, and DIA provided current intelligence to them and assessed the nature of recon missions worldwide, the risks to them from various strange players like Libya and the Soviet Union and China and North Korea and so on. There had been enough shoot-downs over the decades, enough nasty incidents that the JCS got tired of it. So did President Nixon and Kissinger and company. We don't want any more incidents than we have to have with the Soviets. So we had this special group organized to support the Joint Reconnaissance Center. I was part of that. It was part of the year. It was a very interesting three years. Did that, and in the summer of 73, we uh, got assigned to Ramstein, Germany, and we had another five years in Germany. Uh, uh, myself in a NATO assignment at Carroll back in U.S. Air Forces Europe headquarters. So we went over as a team in, in July of 63. Uh, into their respective assignments. And that's a whole other story, don't need to go into the details there, but we did our, uh, 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 the same sergeant helped us get over there too. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, the, NATO, uh, the NATO headquarters was called 4th Allied Tactical Air Force. And in the NATO structure of the time, in time of a conflict or, or crisis, uh, U.S. Air Forces Europe uh, half of the German Air Force and the Canadian Air Force in Europe would all come under this 4th Allied Tactical Air Force and they would defend the area of southern west Germany. There was another Allied Air Force up north which would, def uh, which consisted of, of British, half the German Air Force, Belgians and Dutch, and they defended the north. Anyway, I was in that headquarters for about a year, providing current intelligence uh, briefings and uh, papers and participating in the numerous exercises that NATO had, trying to exercise this complicated wartime structure. And then we, uh, the U.S. advocated and eventually approved, was approved in the NATO structure something called Allied Air Forces Central Europe, which was a combination of those two Allied Tactical Air Forces into one central command. Lots of theories behind it. And a burgeoning computer capability of the U.S. especially, and NATO in general, uh, had enthusiasts of, of this sort of game, command and control, and want to centralize air power. We all know air power doctrine is central control and decentral execution and all this good stuff. So that was a major challenge to set up uh, uh, one of these headquarters, uh, uh, this new concept, and I, I became a part of that as a major uh, in the intel business. A minor player, but nevertheless a player. And in the 76, 1976, um, we both came up for Lieutenant Colonel. I had been up for Lieutenant Colonel before Carroll, and I had failed the promotion once, summer of, uh, actually it was the summer of 75, and I, I didn't make it. Uh, and that sort of pissed me off, actually, which surprised me. I didn't realize I'd have that reaction. I was, I was told in advance by a friend of Carol's who had seen the list earlier. He said, you need to know, you know, ahead of time. You didn't make with that Carol. I said, I don't know. By the time they announced the list publicly, I you know, had my head together. And uh, to, their, to his great credit, there was a colonel whose name I forget, American colonel in the NATO headquarters whose responsibility was to supervise all the Americans in this headquarters in terms of their paperwork and personnel. And he called me in and one or two other guys that hadn't made LC. And this was a, this was a turning point. He said, he said, okay, I understand. You know by now you didn't make it. I said, yes, sir. And he said, what are you going to do about it? It wasn't sympathy. It wasn't tough luck or you're inadequate or anything like that. He goes, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I'm going back to personnel in Texas as soon as you'll let me, and I'm going to find out what the hang was wrong with my folder, and I'm going to do what I can to correct it. He says, exactly the right answer. Go. So I did that, went back, and various. I did various things. Signed up for Air War College by correspondence, and did a good hook of it, and various other things. And uh, 
I got the endorsement of a very remarkable man uh, who was my NATO boss, a Royal Air Force group captain, very interesting guy. He wrote off a, an indignant letter to the U.S. Air Force's Europe commander, who was his NATO boss, but worked for the thing. An indignant letter on his stationery saying he's highly, well, the American part, he was highly pissed that his favorite young officer didn't make lieutenant colonel, and uh, here's his virtues and all this. And, you know, written in very good British ease. <laughs> I've got a copy of it to this day. And uh, uh, my God, the next time I had an officer effect this report, it was endorsed by the commander of U.S. Air Forces Europe, promote this son of a bitch as fast as you can and all that. And next time around, I got promoted, uh, along with Carol, on the same list. And uh, uh, we went on from there. Uh, we, st we stayed in Europe through a couple of extensions until 1978. And in the summer thereof, we were going to be reassigned. By this time, I had been out of a flying assignment for, well, since the summer of 69. So nine long years away from the cockpit. And I was still a rated navigator, made mas master navigator. Uh, the short for that was master gator. I didn't carry that too far. And, uh, but uh, there, was a, there was a crunch, post-Vietnam era crunch. We let many people out of the Air Force after Vietnam. And uh, there was a very great crunch for navigators and pilots both. So anybody who had wings was being called back out of staff jobs to do these sorts of things. So they, they told me, you're going back into the cockpit. I said, well, fair enough. It's time. And frankly, I was sort of itching. It would be interesting to go back flying, even as a lieutenant colonel and navigator. Uh, and I said, but I'm married to this lieutenant colonel intelligence officer. Uh, what can we do about that? And they said, Basically, we don't know, but come back to Texas and we'll talk about it. So I went temporary duty, like I'd done three years earlier. Went back there on a, on a quick trip, self-funded. Uh, uh, and I went back and talked personnel stuff. And basically, we could not find an air base where I would have a flying assignment, where she could have a meaningful intelligence officer assignment at the rank of lieutenant colonel. It was a given at this time in the flying business that you could get a squadron of whatever's airplanes overloaded with lieutenant colonels and majors that, like myself, who hadn't been flying in years and were filling slots that were normally captain slots or, or lieutenant slots. So, you know, I'd go back, I'd be just one of three or four or five lieutenant colonels that were not filling lieutenant colonel jobs. And by that time I said, well, I'll do this for another two or three years and then I'll retire. Uh, but Carol was a rising star, it looked like. And if anybody was going to make full colonel, it was going to be her. So I said, uh, we have to find a place where she has a meaningful job. Well, they came up with things like McGuire, New Jersey, C 141s. I said, well, okay, that'd be interesting. But what can you do for her? The best they could find was a major's uh, billet for an intelligence officer where she would not have the security clearances. And, uh, but they tried to make it sound good. And said, no thanks, don't want that if we can avoid it. A couple other bases. And none of that worked, so I finally decided to retire. And Car that, having that happen freed Carol up, and she got a, a good assignment in the Washington, D.C. area again. So we went back to Washington. Again, there was a separation of a few months. I retired effectively at the end of January 1979, 20 years. And Carol was already in her, her new assignment in Washington in the Defense Intelligence College as a instructor and what they call deputy dean. Excuse me just a second. Sure. Okay, you bet, Mike, and we'll be talking later about the wonderful talk business. Thanks, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, you bet. This one. Okay. Uh, maybe I can just finish up the narration on sure. the military bit. Uh, fundamentally what happened, I retired at the end of January uh, 79, and Carol's still active duty. Uh, I took a job with a defense contractor dealing with NATO command and control issues, which sort of fit what I'd been doing. But I didn't like it uh, that well. Uh, in the defense contractor world, you're private enterprise for one thing, and I, uh, you're working for somebody who's trying to make money. I still had the ethic, serve your country. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, but I did this because this was, this was good, it was good experience, and uh, I could use my background. A company called BTAC in Arlington, Virginia. Did that for a year, 
And then in the early 1980, openings came up in Defense Intelligence Agency for civilian analysts, and I joined them in April of 1980 as a GS-12 uh, and became a civilian analyst on the, on the uh, Soviet Air Force uh, with, all, with all kinds of good security clearances. And it was just a good follow-on to my NATO intelligence officer job. And uh, uh, I became the guy in Defense Intelligence Agency on uh, Soviet Air Force's air transport aviation uh, element, military transport aviation, which sort of fit my background. I got to do that for another 16 years and finally retired as a civilian analyst in, uh, in 1996, 11 years ago now. Uh, uh, Carol herself uh, stayed in that college. Uh, she came up for colonel twice uh, but didn't make it and she herself retired in 1985 and became a defense contractor herself and then became a museum guide and then a tour guide in Washington which is what she's doing now. Mm -hmm. That sort of wraps it up. We, she does her thing, as I say. I do uh, various projects, family history, military history, military aviation, uh, the volunteer historian jobs that I've got, um, and uh, you know, a couple of other things uh, along the lines, which has brought me here to this museum uh, about every year ever since its uh, opening back mm -hmm. in aught one or aught two, doing research here on, on the guard. And, so on. So it's been a pleasure being here. So I imagine uh, from being in the Air Force from, well, 20 years from 59 till 79, uh, you must have seen some, a lot of changes. Mm -hmm. um, during, the, during the Vietnam uh, War, uh, were there any problems with personnel in the Air Force as far as um, uh, racial problems. I know, like on the Army side, we've heard a lot of, a lot of details on, on personnel problems, etc. In Vietnam itself, I do not recall any issues coming up. We did have um, several blacks in our uh, in our in the enlisted side of my flight. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, the air crew on an AC-47 was pilot, two pilots and a half. And, and a flight engineer, and a loadmaster, and two gunners, mm -hmm. uh, all en en enlisted folks. Uh, and I do not recall any instances of this time. By the late 60s, in the Air Force's environments that I was in, um, a lot of that had, had, had gone away. Of course, the, air, the normal Air Force environment, while barracks on air bases and so on, it's not quite as intense as, a, mm -hmm. as an Army environment and and the type of combat we were in was not nearly as intense as units could be in yeah you know, with the risk of life out in the army or marine corps especially um, so i didn't see that much there was some underlying tensions you know mm -hmm. good old white southern boys coming in fresh off from mississippi wherever would have our problems with black i heard a little bit of that but being a, a captain at the time i uh, i wasn't involved uh, with that so there was probably some, but I was unaware of it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, during that time period, uh, the peace movement, did that um, have any effects on, on the bases you were at? Or were there protests or anything of that sort? In Vietnam itself, we had heard of all this stuff. It was on the news and so on. When we got back to the States, remember, we'd been out of the States effectively from 1965 early to, in Carol's case, late 64 until the fall of 69. So we were gone mm -hmm. for the burgeoning of the peace movement as well as the burgeoning of the Vietnam War and its effect on the home, on the home country here. Uh, so although we knew a lot about it by reading the newspapers and, and, and hearing it on the radio, and we didn't have much television in Armed Forces TV in, in, in Europe. So we didn't have the drama of TV in, in Germany in particular. We had some of it in Vietnam, of course, we had the mm -hmm. uh, uh, all that. But uh, we were sort of isolated from that until we got back to the States in 69. And then we had to live through that here, especially in the Washington, D.C. area, uh, right up until, of course, the fall of Saigon in 75. We were there when a couple, three protests went on at the Pentagon itself. And that's as close as I got personally to uh, to that uh, issue. 
was one year, one, one, one day when uh, protesters threatened to shut down the Pentagon by putting an unpenetrable ring of protesters around the whole building. Mm -hmm. Well, they underestimated the size of the Pentagon for one thing, <laughs> and, uh, and also a whole lot of uh, cops and soldiers and National Guard and everything else. Uh, and, and we, military and so on, went through with showed our badges and uniforms and so on, and we got through. And everybody was very polite. I personally never had any kind of a problem or a confrontation. Neither Carol nor I had a problem going back into the States from Vietnam, unlike mm -hmm. the stories you hear. Unlike a lot of folks who, especially late late sixties and early seventies, when the protest movement was strongest, uh, where you got the you know baby killers and all that kind mm -hmm. of horrible stuff. Uh, aside, one of the things we maybe one of the few things we learned from the Vietnam era is to uh, whether you or not you like the war in Iraq, you do support the troops, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we try to keep the troops insulated from any anti-war stuff. It hasn't totally worked, but that's that's one of the lessons we've learned, I think, as an instinctive as the American people. So, no, the, uh, the personal effect was irritation at the peace movement, understanding the peace movement. I, I understood where they were coming from. By, by watching the war close up for 15 months, uh, like I was, I, I knew that the North Vietnamese and the VC were extremely bad guys. But uh, uh, I also knew we were having deep troubles fending them off and that we as a nation were not as committed as we might have thought we might be, might have early on. So I, I, I was having my struggle. I, even then I knew in the late 60s the only way we could win this thing was not so much firepower and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. was we had to win the war in the Vietnamese people's minds. And so I did some additional work with uh, uh, local orphanages and schools and so on, part of the trying to be friends with the Vietnamese people. And uh, they were lovely folks, but mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't going to work. We, the United States, was, were not going to go and nuke Hanoi and, and, and win the war in some dramatic way like that. It was just a very rough thing we'd gotten our, our arms around, and it's very tragic. Mm -hmm. So, I personally had nothing against peace protesters, and Carol is especially that way. Uh, as a tour guide, she sees lots of people of all kinds at the Vietnam Wall. Mm -hmm. And she has had to cope with a lot of reactions of one kind or another from people who've let their emotions run. Sure. And she's, so she would tell her background when she was over there doing what. And, some people, teachers, for example, would come and say, as a student, I was a peace protester, please forgive me. And she says, nothing to forgive. And they hug each other and they do all this girl stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of emotional stuff. She's had guys, hardened Marine Corps people, who would finally let go at the wall, or army types. Uh, it's, it's, it's been hard. But uh, that's our take, fundamentally. Since your retirement, have you uh, joined any veterans organizations or attended any reunions or anything like that? Nothing formal like the American Legion or VFW. Uh, the closest I could say to that is being in, in a reunion, running reunions and being in associations for two of my flying units mm -hmm. and going to uh, those and being the historian for them. I do feel an obligation towards uh, people like that to, to help them or their descendants with uh, uh, helping them find their background. It's one of my great delights right now is, is helping people out. Uh, you'll get people call up and say, my father was in your union back in the 60s in Germany, and uh, what do you know about him? So I'll dig around in the files I've got, and, or in our, in our memories, mm -hmm. collect the memories, and come up with what happened to old Bill. It's got to be pretty rewarding to be able to help a family member like that. Yeah, yeah. It's especially interesting you know, when we've had accidents. In my tanker business, for example, we had over a 12-year existence of these KB-50 tankers. We had maybe 16 fatal crashes, lost a bunch of people, 90-plus. And once in a while, somebody will come in and say, my father was a refueling operator on an airplane so-and-so, and, -so, and this he was lost. And, uh, family never heard why or how. Mm -hmm. So I'd dig around. And I'd 
dig out what I can, the accident reports, the, uh, the details, find people who might have known him and get them in contact. And I, li I like it. I like that very much. Okay. Anything uh, in closing that you'd like to add? Or I think you've <laughs> pretty well covered just about everything. Um, not that come off the top of my head. Uh, this is the sort of thing that, uh, uh, you know, 20 minutes after we shut down or, or I'm on the road. Such and such. But uh, uh, no, I'll always, I'll always be happy. I grew up in that small rural town in northern New York where my parents were where they were. And uh, growing up in rural America, it's not the rural south, it's the rural northern New York. It's, mm -hmm. it's, but it's a lot. It's, the accents are just different. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was great. I had good teachers in the school systems uh, that encouraged the hell out of us. And uh, uh, it's a great environment um, up there. And I was happy to on RPI as well, even though I didn't become an engineer, it was a, a great educational experience. And if you want to zoom in on this shot that shows the two of us, oh yes, uh, that's a, on our retirement in 1979. That's Carol and, and, and myself. Okay, now I'm going to stop this right now because we're okay. just running out of tape, and uh, you have more photographs, so we'll get on another tape. Okay, I think we're rolling now. All right, what do you have next? Okay, I've got a, a, three of the standard Air Force portraits that you took of officers uh, at various stages of their career, particularly after they got promoted. And uh, I don't know why I want to show you my youthful self, but uh, it's uh, it's all part of part of the record. Part of the fucking <laughs> record. Uh, this is me as a second lieutenant Brown Bar as I entered uh, nav training down in. Uh, Texas in uh, January 1959. Yeah, uh, okay. Youthful soul. Okay. Um, when you hold them up, just hold them up uh, back towards you. You don't have to bring them up close oh, to okay. the camera. All right. Because I can zoom right in on them. Oh, okay. Do you want to do that again then? Um, yeah, let me try it. It'll, it'll be a little sort of less like blurry. That. Yeah, this that's fine. Just like that. Okay. okay. All right. And you show us the next one. Next one is only about four years later, um, uh, but I got my wings there, so I'm very proud. I got my wings, and uh, I'm a first lieutenant, and I'm beginning to get the bags under the eyes, but uh, you know, that comes with uh, <laughs> the loss of immaturity, or whatever you want to call it. Okay. February 62. And this is one of those shots they took of you when you were a senior officer, and you were supposed to look determined and far-sighted and uh, ready to, uh, to uh, take on the world. Uh, and become a colonel if the promotion board lets you. So this is this is me having just made lieutenant colonel in July of 1976. Okay. A, lot, a lot's changed since then. The <laughs> <laughs> okay, got it. That's that's uh, fundamentally it, except for the last one where I'm supposed to look. No, that's uh, where did it go? We really want. Yeah, this is one where uh, which was. No, this is one earlier. Don't need that. Okay. Uh, so those three would, uh, would okay. illustrate that. Um, let me just uh, ask you also, when you were in Vietnam, did you uh, get to see uh, Bob Hope or, or any uh, USO shows or anything like that? Uh, no, curiously, I don't recall them ever coming to Benoit when I was uh -huh. there, uh, those kinds of shows. We had, actually, paradoxically, I got to see more entertainment when I visited my wife down at Tonsonute in the officers club there. Uh, and there was sort of a reason for that. Um, uh, she was in a headquarters unit and uh, she had a lot of comparable um, uh, staff officers working with her and, and for her. She was a senior captain at that time, had lieutenants working for her and so on and NCOs. But the officers club was always a place you went there and it was teaming with people. Even though Tonsonwood Air Base itself occasionally got rocket attacks, um, it was pretty lively officers club. And there was lots of entertainment for hire, whether it was through the USO, I'm not sure. I don't remember seeing any headliners mm -hmm. in the country. At Benoit, the, the atmosphere was very different, in particular for our unit. Benoit hosted a fighter wing of F-100s 
plus various auxiliary air units like an and army, army aviation units uh, there, like our spooky gunship outfit. And uh, we, were, we were quartered well away from the officers club. And since we flew all night and slept during the daytime, uh, not many of us went to the Oak Club. It was a trek over there, and it was a trek back in your Jeep, right away. And uh, there wasn't much actually going on except drinking. Mm -hmm. And if you were on alert to go fly, you were better not be drinking. So when we had parties there, we had them in the morning uh, when the flying shift got off duty. And uh, so we didn't have any professional entertainment, but mm -hmm. I can remember at the Benoit Officers Club. What I remember is we would have a party over in a corner, and uh, it would be all the guys that, are, that were just coming off of flying, and all the guys who didn't fly last night but were getting tired and about to go to sleep. Because <laughs> we we slept basically 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That was uh -huh. our time to sleep. We had air-conditioned quarters, thank God. But. Uh, we have these raucous parties over in one corner, and we uh, we compete to see how popping the champagne corks. You get the corks the farthest across the uh, across the room. See what you can hit. Uh, see the highest ranking guy that you could get on their table or whatever, <laughs> and piss them off, and, and, and so on. Most of them understood, <laughs> and uh, didn't bother us, so that was okay. Um, we did have we did have a month's TDY myself and a few other crews up into uh, Southeast Asia. To Udorn Air Base, Thailand, and we were flying missions. This is in March of '69, in support of friendlies in the Laotian Mountains. Uh, they were under heavy attack from the Pathet Lao and the North Vietnamese at that time. It looked like a serious breakthrough, so we were doing all we could that spring. And so we were flying missions up into the mountains of, of northern Laos, and that was my first experience in the mountains doing this kind of flying. That was pretty intimidating, but the base also hosted. F-4 units and F-105 units that flew over the north, mm -hmm. and that was especially intense. That was your most intense, probably the most intense Air Force flying that, that anybody did in, in the Southeast Asian conflict. This is where you really got the SA-2 missiles and the uh, AAA was bad, and you took heavy losses a lot. So these guys were very hyped, and the parties in that old club were non-stop. They were flying 24 hours a day. They were reconnaissance as well as some ground attack. And so whenever you went into that club, there was a party going. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, it, it, I would say it was a quite an intense, it was, it was more intense than Benoit. At Benoit, where we were under attack a lot uh, by mortars and rockets, uh, everybody, most people anyway, had the good sense in the evening to not wander far from a shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you ever have any close calls with incoming rockets? In the by saying the, the, the uh, detection system around Benoit was very, very good. By this time of the war, 68, 69, they had a series of uh, radars uh, that could detect uh, rocket rounds in the ascendancy mm -hmm. coming up. So the security police hit the sirens before the rockets even got to their apogee. Uh, so you had a 15 or 20 seconds to get to a shelter. I see before they hit, first one hit. And uh, we made sure there were shelters near all of our quarters. Uh, mm -hmm. People built up sandbag shelters and then made more sophisticated ones over the years. So there was little danger there, and there were not that many attacks, and they were very erratic. Uh, you didn't aim these rockets. Mm -hmm. They were not able to get close enough to Benoit to fire mortars. So the, rocket, the rockets were the main thing. In one case, though, it was dramatically different, and that was in uh, uh, the, the, what we call the Tet 69 offensive that I mentioned earlier. In February of 69, at the time of Tet, um, they did a surprise attack. We got warning that something was up, and we got uh, 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 augmented manning and so on. And we'd already flown the first shift of the evening. I, I was airborne for the first shift of the particular night that that started, from sundown to midnight. And nothing much had happened, and we landed, and we went to the chow hall. And then we were going to go on ground alert in case anything else did happen the rest of the evening. And we knew, there, we'd heard word through the intel channels that something was up. 
So it wasn't a huge surprise. We were in the chow hall line when the sirens went and crump, crump, crump happened. And we said, holy shit, we got the hang out of the chow hall and into the nearest ditch. Mm -hmm. not, not sheltered, but the ditch. And then came another round of rockets and a third round. Some of them came pretty close to the chow hall. So there was stuff flying around well above our heads. But uh, uh, we would found these nice convenient ditches that uh, Unless, unless the stuff was very close, we were okay. That was that was pretty close. And then there was a let up, so we all got into our couple jeeps and raced to the flight line. We knew what we were supposed to do. We didn't have to check in with anybody. Somebody might have, I don't know. I can't remember whether we got a walkie-talkie system or not. Mm -hmm. But we raced straight to the, to the flight line. The engines on our aircraft were war already warmed up and, and turning over. And we leaped into the airplane and roared out on the runway, and I got another round of rockets hit while we were taxiing out. And uh, we took off amidst the rockets, and you know, all you could do is take off amidst the rockets and hope that nothing hit you. Well, nothing did. We got, we got airborne and got sent to about three different targets before we exhausted our ammo and flares. And some of the AAA around those targets was pretty interesting. Long been Army headquarters uh, took heavy attacks that night, I remember. And it was the next night after that that the attacks continued and the Air Force's only, well, until recently, the only enlisted Medal of Honor uh, incident took place. And it was a hitherto undistinguished loadmaster in our very flight, uh, John Levito, native of Connecticut, Airman Second Class at the time, who uh, won the Medal of Honor for his spooky gunship was flying over Long Men and uh, took a mortar round in the right wing, blew a hole in the right wing of his AC-47, took shrapnel all up to put down the cabin, decked the two gunners and himself that were in the back, uh, and the uh, airplane went uncontrollable briefly. And what happened in his instance, he had a flare. His job was to drop the flares. He had a flare in his hand, and he had already set the timing on it when this explosion took place, and he was knocked on his ass. And the flare was rolling around inside the cabin, mm -hmm. and the timer was going. And he had taken multiple shrapnel wounds. And, he's, uh, and the testimony was that he couldn't even use his arms. He, he was virtually paralyzed. But he, he used the rest of his body and inched the flare over to the door and inched it out. And it went out, and then it exploded just beyond the airplane. And, uh, so it saved the crew. And uh, they landed. And uh, the aircraft commanders, uh, as they hauled the, the, the wounded people away, the aircraft commander said, I'm putting you in for the Air Force Cross. And we heard that the next, this, 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 that morning. Mm -hmm. So I raced out to the flight line that evening and got all these pictures of the, the AC-47 all riddled with shrapnel. And then it turned out that some of the Air Force said, Air Force Cross, hell no, we're going to put him in for the Medal of Honor. And he did get it. Uh, proud to have known the guy. Uh, like so many Medal of Honor winners and those kind of people, you know, they don't broadcast it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you just find yourself in a situation and, and then it's your, inner, it's your inner workings that get you to do what you're supposed to do. Do you know if he's still living? Unfortunately, no. He died maybe about 1999 or so. There is a, an Air Force Enlisted Heritage Hall down at what they now call Gunter Annex in Alabama near Montgomery, uh, which is a, essentially a museum to the Air Force enlisted men. And in there they've got Levito's story, among others, and uh, a replica AC-47 parked outside with the markings of the airplane that uh, he was in that night. And they've got a, a, uh, they've, they've got a dummy inside there showing him moving the flare out the mm -hmm. door. Uh, very impressive, but uh, being the, the nutcase that I am, I noticed that they had the wrong squadron markings on the airplane. So I've given them slides showing them what the airplane really looked like, and the next time they paint it, they're going to. Uh -huh. But uh, uh, he, he was quite a guy. I, I had him pegged earlier. I, he and I had flown on the same crew a few times. I had him pegged as a guy who was smarter than he acted, and uh, went in basically to avoid the draft. Just did what had to be done, but that there was something, uh, something there. I didn't mm -hmm. know quite what it was, but there was some potential there. 
Sure enough. Cool. He went on to a career in the Veterans Administration, uh, helping Connecticut veterans. Uh, so, loved it. That's my brush for greatness in that line, anyway. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome, Mike. Appreciate doing this. Getting it down. I appreciate you're doing it for all the other guys, too.